So far, we were modeling behavior based on people's own utility function and their own feasibility constraints. However, in the real world, people's actions affect both your utility and your constraints. So social interactions are exactly those situations in which actions by others affect the outcomes of your own optimization process. The way we model them is called game theory. Game theory is one of the most exciting fields in our profession because it allows you to understand strategic behavior. That is optimizing behavior based on the optimizing behavior of others. <clears throat> so how do we model it? How do we, how do we think about social interactions and strategic behavior? We use a modeling tool we call a game. In a game, you need players. And you need players because there will be some interaction between them. When one person optimized based on your individual utility and individual constraints, a second player was, was not necessary. But now, other people's actions do affect your own outcomes. And as a result, you need them. You need them in the model. You need them in the way you think about the world. But what do these players do? They have a set of possible actions we call strategies. The strategies tell you what you can and what you can't do when somebody else has made a decision about their own actions. And finally, know that those strategies affect you. So you need information how, how um, they affect you and how your own actions affect others. This information is given in the final element of the game, which is the payoffs. So let's play a game. Let's see how strategic interaction works. The players in this, in this in the invisible hand game are two farmers, Anil and Bala. They differ in how productive their lands are uh, for growing rice and cassava. By the way, cassava is a substitute for bread, rice, and potatoes in Latin America and the Caribbean, if you want to know. Um, but you have to cook it before you eat it. Um, so, so, so Anil and Bao produce their crop and bring it to the market. And market forces are in action. So if the market sees a lot of supply of a certain good, its price is very likely to go down. And vice versa, if the market sees a shortage of a certain type of good, its price is likely to go up. Um, this is the way we model, the way we think about, in other words, what happens in a game. In the simple, simple matrix, you can, you can see both players, Anil and Bala. You can also see their possible actions, or in other words, their set of strategies. Now, both can grow either rice or cassava. So what will happen if both choose to grow rice? That's the upper left corner of, of this simple uh, matrix. Well, there will be a lot of rice on the market and its price is likely to go down. But please recall that anil is better at producing cassava than rice. So the low price of rice will benefit both of them in a different way. Anil will have a lower payoff than Bala because Bala is better at producing rice. So a similar thing happens in the opposite scenario. Both of them grow cassava. And it will benefit more from it because Bala is not good enough at producing cassava. You can also think about what happens if they choose to produce the crops they're good at. If Anil specializes in cassava, whereas Bala specializes in rice, then there is no glut in anything and, and they both enjoy high prices of their crops. And as a result, their payoffs are likely to be better than in a scenario in which both of them choose to work a crop that does not suit their land. <clears throat> so as you can see, this basic preview of the game is quite intuitive. It reflects what happens on the market and what is likely to happen with the payoffs of the players in case certain strategies are rolled out. To find the most likely outcome of this game, in other words, to find the equilibrium in this game, we need some actual 
payoffs. Those actual play, uh, payoffs come, come next. Now, as a result of the preview above, and depending on their strategies, Anil and Bella have the following payoffs. Because this matrix is filled with payoffs, we call it a payoff matrix. The payoff matrix has a few intuitive elements. First, it tells you the players, Anil and Bala. Then it tells you the set of strategies that they have. So either one of them can choose to produce either cassava or rice at any given time. And finally, the payoff matrix contains the payoffs. Now, the payoffs were the outcomes for each player in case the other player adopts a certain strategy. Now, as you can see, the payoff matrix contains everything you need to know about this particular game. The players, the strategies, and probably above all, the payoffs. So we can easily see how each of the players will behave in case the other player adopts a certain strategy. To see things a bit more clearly, let's do um, the payoffs properly. Let's focus on the upper left cell. The upper left cell tells you what will Anil and Bala get if they both grow rice, right? Anil will get one in that case, and Bala will get three. Why? Because there is a glut of rice. Prices are low. And on top of this, Anil is better at growing cassava than rice, whereas Bala grows rice better. So exactly the opposite payoffs will happen in the lower right cell. Because there is a lot of cassava, prices of cassava, cassava will be low. But because Anil is better at, than Bala at growing uh, cassava, Anil will get the higher payoff. Now, if both of them grow the crop they're good at, prices of those crops will be high. And as a result, both of them will get a payoff, which is higher than before. However, if both of them grow the crop they're not good at, they will get high prices, but, but, but they will not be able to produce a lot of crop for the market, and, they will, and therefore their overall payoff will be much lower than before. This will happen if Anil grows rice and, the and at the same time Bala grows cassava. Okay, so now we understand the payoffs. What do we do with these payoffs? Um, we start thinking about best responses. The best response is what's best for you given the actions that are possible by others. So what's best for Anil given the possible actions that Bala can take? Well, if Bala chooses to grow rice, we found ourselves in the left co column of the payoffs matrix. Then in that column, Anil can choose between two possible strategies, rice and cassava. Choosing rice gives him one, while choosing cassava gives four to Anil. It is clear that Anil will choose to grow cassava if Bala chooses to grow rice. We draw a small dot to mark the best strategy for Anil if Bala grows rice. At the same time, if Bala grows cassava, the possible payoffs for Anil are also clear. Two and three. As three is better than two, Anil would choose what? Of course, he will choose cassava again. So it turns out that no matter what Bala does, Anil's best response is to always choose to grow cassava. We call these responses a dominant strategy, a strategy you choose to enact no matter what the other player does. Note that to be dominant, a strategy needs to produce the highest possible payoffs in any scenario, in any strategy that the other player employs. So as four is better than one and three is better than two, growing cassava is always better for Neil. That's why we say that growing cassava is his dominant strategy. Let's see if Bala has a dominant strategy. How do we know? Well, we need to see what's best for Bala given the actions of the other players. 
Let's see. If anil grows rice, that's the upper row of the payor, uh, the payoff matrix. Bao has two options, right? Rice and cassava. Rice gives Bala three, whereas cassava gives him two. So it's clear that in case Anil chooses rice, the best response of Bala is to grow rice. But notice what happens to the payoffs of Bala if Anil grows cassava. Bala can earn four if he grows if he grows rice, and only one if he grows cassava. But then it's clear that in case Anil grows cassava, Bala really has no option. He will choose rice as well. No matter what Anil chooses, actually, Bala is always better off when he chooses rice. But then this means that not only Anil has a dominant strategy, but also Bala has a dominant strategy, a strategy which yields higher payoffs than other strategies, no matter what the other players choose. So if, if both players choose their dominant strategies, and they will, because they're rational after all, we have a phenomenon called a dominant strategy, equilibrium. This is a predicted outcome of social interactions, given the structure of payoffs of the players and, and their strategies. So if both players play their dominant strategy, we have a dominant strategy equilibrium. Notice that in this particular case, the dominant strategy equilibrium leads to the best possible payoff for both players. So what are the larger implications of the dominant strategy equilibrium? Um, first, notice that when Anil works the crop in which he's more skilled, and at the same time, Bala specializes in the crop in which he is more skilled, then the result is optimal for everyone. There is no better result. This means society is better off when everyone specializes in what they do best. But go back 250 years. This is exactly what the founding father of our profession argued in his Wealth of Nations. We can see this, um, uh, we can see this in action, actually, here and now in this in the invisible hand game. But notice also that both Anil and Bala know their payoffs in advance. They know that if they specialize, they will earn more than if they don't specialize in what they're good at. So assuming they're rational individuals, they will specialize in the field in which they are good. Now, also notice that that the equilibrium result of this game is not only that everyone has and everyone plays their dominant strategies. The equilibrium result, the result that is most likely to occur given the structure of incentives and constraints and the rules of the game, so that equilibrium result is that social interactions lead to the best outcome for each player, as well as for society as a whole. Society in this case consists, of course, of those two nice people here, Anil and Bala. So when there is a dominant strategy equilibrium, people uh, want to choose what's best for them. Doing what's best for you leads to socially superior outcomes in this game. But is it always the case? In, in the next video, uh, we'll see the same game with slightly different payoffs, which may lead to society being stuck in a bad outcome, in a bad equilibrium. We'll have suboptimal results for everyone involved. Keep watching to learn when this may happen. Thank you.